Hi, it's Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now, if you're interested in conservation, then you've probably heard of a term called rewilding. And over the last decade or so, it's represented a growing movement within the industry to restoring nature back to its former glory. And one of the organisations involved in the movement is Citizen Zoo. It's a young UK charity dedicated to rewilding, made up of a passionate team and volunteers around the country working to restore nature and help species and habitats to thrive. And today we're lucky enough to be speaking to Ben Stockwell, who's their senior rewilding officer at Citizen Zoo. We discuss why rewilding is such an exciting opportunity for conservationists, how it works, and we also discuss some examples of how you can get involved. As always, we discuss what it's like to do his work, nuts and bolts, the highs and lows, and also his advice for people like you who might be interested in following in his footsteps. It's an inspiring, fun, and really informative chat. Enjoy. So rewilding is this really popular topic. It's really gained huge attention over like recent years with some exciting projects that are showing big benefits to wildlife. But, you know, in your words, like why why do you think rewilding is exciting for conservationists? You know, what is it about this this idea that's really kind of taken hold? Well, I can only really speak in terms of my personal opinion on that in terms of how I got excited about rewilding. But yeah, I think that many people... I read uh, George Monbiot's Feral, and it kind of opened up a whole new door of what conservation could be about, and in my mind, kind of what should be about. Um, thinking about you know what was here before, and not necessarily creating that landscape, but thinking about how we can make proactive steps to make the landscape more similar to that in a obviously a new way. We're going to have novel ecosystems just by the fact that humans are now kind of the dominant species within the landscape so and you know we've left our mark on it all over the place but if we can think about what it looked like before what species compositions were there um we can try and reflect that and have some sort of level of ecosystem functionality that's going to support a wider biodiversity essentially and for me in particular it was just really exciting thinking about species that had come before that i genuinely had no idea that had ever existed in the uk until I read that book. So even things like wolves, I'd never even thought about that um, in a UK context. Um, it was, yeah, same with beavers, actually. Just hadn't even thought that they would have been all over the UK um, 400 years ago. So for me, I think it's, it was really exciting to think about how much potential there is and what we could do to make positive changes and what that would mean for both biodiversity, but also for us as well, because we're all going to benefit in terms of ecosystem services and all the rest of it and mental health and well-being being uh, from enjoying green spaces and the wildlife that's there yeah. so yeah that was my personal opinion i think what i think it has well captures people's minds in the sense that it's opened up yeah new possibilities and new ways of thinking especially in the urban realm from working at citizen zoo like we have a big urban focus and I think when you tell people in London, say, that beavers once lived here, they find that quite incredible and that the landscape would have been incredibly different 400 years ago. So it's almost because people in urban areas particularly maybe are less, well, see less wildlife, that they're more kind of open to actually having it back on their doorstep yeah. in that sense. So I think it's worked quite well in the urban context. And I think... To an extent, it has in the rural context as well. I know it does have its um, kind of proponents um, and its issues as well. But I think I think it's just generally that thinking about what could be um, with that kind of inspiration from the past, I think, does get people excited. Well, me personally, anyway. It does. And it's not just you, me and loads of people love this idea. And it's funny, like in a way, just the word conservation is almost the wrong word for what we're seeking to do. Conservation yeah. to me just means like maintaining status quo, <laughs> keeping things yeah. as they are. And what you're talking about is make, rewinding the clock, making things better how they used to be back in sort of uh, sort of historical times, really. And we don't know what we've lost, really, but we can bring it back. I was quite excited also by the book um, Wilding by Isabella Tree and all the work that happens at, on the Nep estate here in the UK. And 
as someone who worked a little bit on bird conservation um, through BirdLife International, we talked a lot about migratory birds like turtle doves that are rapidly declining and still are across, you know, across its range. And it was always thought of that a major driver of that is something that happens on migration routes. And I'm sure that's part of the key. But what the Nepa state showed, which is a big rewilding estate that you know way more about than I do, I'm sure, is that they return and they return quickly in numbers. You know, so for me, it's like, well, we have control over uh, some key species here. You know, even when they migrate, even what we do here makes a difference. And it can happen quickly. It's that idea of speed that nature can return quickly if you just sort of give it half a chance, really. Those are both super exciting sort of ideas, really. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny you should say that about the conservation, the term itself. It was only really when I started my role at System Zoo, I sat on a, a, a webinar. Um, so I only worked for the IUCN, um, kind of the rewilding, I can't remember what the staff, maybe the task force or board or something, but yeah. it was basically saying how traditional conservation is very much about holding what we've got, which is obviously really important. And it's really valuable because it is disappearing at a very quick rate. But when you think of that in the context of shifting baseline syndrome and what how different things were 60 years ago and how generations think of it in the past. And now that that knowledge is kind of disappearing, obviously generation on generation, we're just losing more and more and it's kind of becoming more of an accepted thing that's happening just you know, right before our very eyes. So I think rewilding for me kind of open, opens up that whole world of actually we can reclaim a bit of this. And I know, it, you know, in many ways it's, it's similar to restoration and typical restoration and that, does similar things and all the rest of it, but yeah, it's uh, it's quite a captivating topic. I think and there's a lot of a lot um, of possibilities around it, and, and yeah, like I said, Wilding is a fantastic book, and Nepa State is an incredible place to visit. It was the first rewilding site I visited visited back in 2017. My my girlfriend got us a, a weekend trip there for, for my birthday. We went to watch the um the deer rut and went on the safari, and it was yeah, absolutely amazing. It's an incredible place to go. Yeah, it's on it's on my bucket list still as well. Yeah, so in a nutshell, like what is rewilding? Like, how could you sort of characterize it, uh, and how is it different to say traditional conservation? Uh, so, I guess if you ask ten people what rewilding is, you probably get ten different answers. Right. Yeah. I personally see it as well. It was born out of the three C's from the nineties cause corridors and carnivals and probably the most famous example in terms of rewilding in action on a big scale large scale was in america yellowstone national park reintroducing gray wolves what that meant in terms of the uh, um, deer populations trees bouncing back um, from lower deer numbers beavers then returning and rivers actually kind of shifting direction completely fish returning and all the rest of it wow. um so that in itself for me kind of and then obviously actually Yellowstone kind of being joined up by a corridor to the Yukon National Park as well um, and helping those species kind of traverse the landscape. So that in its, I think its purest form is, is what rewilding is all about. It's kind of creating that perfect functioning ecosystem. I think for me, rewilding though has to be a lot more realistic, particularly here in the UK where um, we don't have as much space as that realistically. Um, but I still think we can adopt lots of the underlying principles of that and thinking about how do we reinstate some of that functionality, mm -hmm. um, whether it be on a large scale, you know, on, you say in somewhere in northern Scotland where you're going to have lots of space to do some incredible things or whether it's, you know, a large nature reserve here in London. There's still things you can do to adapt and actually try and um, add in that ecosystem functionality and thinking about what species were there before. Um, and if appropriate, whether you could reintroduce them and what impact would that have in terms of the benefits it will bring about. So mm. I do take quite a, um, I personally don't take it in its absolutely purest form because for me, I think it's a great topic and a great word because it gets people excited about it. And whether that opens up people to get interested in wildlife further down the line, um, whether it be young people who are getting interested in the first time just thinking about getting excited about potentially beavers being back in the landscape or something like that yeah i think that's no bad thing and i think 
it it doesn't need to be kind of shoehorned into a box of specific definitions to um to be termed that because I think the bigger picture is getting people excited mm. um, and making sure that people are interested. And if people are interested, they're more likely to want to protect wildlife um, and actually conserve it and have a positive impact on the environment. And I think that's what being a conservationist is all about, whether it's working in the field of rewilding or you know strictly conservation. Um, yeah. But, and then in terms of the question about what I would define conservation as, that is a huge question. I, I think traditional conservation has often been about thinking about specific habitats or specific species, which yeah. on many sites, you know, we absolutely need to protect um, different species or different places because of the incredible flora or fauna that they contain. Um, and they should be managed in specific ways. But I think rewilding for me is more about that process led attitude and thinking about how if we let nature kind of do the le legwork, what's going to happen next um, and what might return and things might change year on year. I think that for me is quite exciting um, to see you know, what, what changes you're going to have one year to the next, essentially. I love that term, letting nature do the legwork. I think that describes it so neatly, actually. That's my sort of perception is it is a little bit more about standing back a little bit and letting nature allow it to take its course than trying to sort of manage and direct it too much but i might be oversimplifying no i, I completely agree. I, I agree with that personally um i think there might be purists out there who would yeah say that it's very much about not having any sort of um intervention at, at all uh, but yeah. i think it is very much about well yeah taking a step back and thinking at some point you might have to intervene because that, that, that is just the nature of it but um but no, I can I agree. I agree with that with saying that for sure. So tell us a little bit then about Citizen Zoo, this amazing organization that you work for. Um it's all about rewilding. That's central to who you are and what you do. But yeah, that Citizen Zoo 101, what is it? Um what are you seeking to achieve? How do you how do you function? Yeah. Uh so we're a fairly young organization. We were yep. founded in 2016. Um, we initially actually ran, well, launched a, a conference to focus on rewilding, actually, and kind of bring it to the public sphere, mm. get um, practitioners around the table, along with um, people from the farming community, to discuss, well, the whole topic, essentially, and try and have productive conversations around it. And then from there, we've launched our own pro project. Um, we, we have, well, first and foremost, we, we look to do species reintroductions. Um, but we do that through what we, uh, well, we try and pride ourselves on community-led species reintroductions, essentially. Yep. So pe putting local people at the heart of those projects. Um, so, for example, one of our first projects works on a species of grasshopper called the largemouth grasshopper, which is one of the UK's rarest. It was once found pretty much throughout the south of England. But as of 2018, it was restricted to just three sites in the New Forest, Dorset, and the and Somerset. Um, but our project essentially was to work with the local community to reintroduce it back into its previous geographical range throughout Norfolk and hopefully the surrounding counties. Did that mean so, bringing it from overseas or were there still pockets here in the UK you could sort of redistribute from? Yeah, so we every year we run a trip down to the New Forest um, right. and do surveys over two days where we count the uh, adult LMGs that we find in the wilds. And for every 10 that we find, we take one for captive breeding purposes. Right. And this is obviously with all the full permissions of Natural England and Forestry Commission and the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and then they are used for a captive breeding program um, the, following, well, the following summer. Um, so basically from June through to uh, late August every year for the past four years now. We've had 30 volunteers in total, home breeding grasshoppers. So we give them full training, we give them all the equipment they need, and we give them like ongoing um, support, answer any questions they have. Uh, and they're essentially they're going out on a daily basis and feeding these tiny grasshoppers that have hatched from tiny little egg pods right through to adulthood. Um, and we do two release days over the summer. So one in late July and one in late August. Yeah. Um, and it's been, yeah, an incredible way to get local people actually involved in kind of grassroots conservation. Yeah. Um, and it's also been incredibly effective in terms of actually at the outputs itself. So 
doing that, we've released over 4,000 individuals back across four sites in, in Norfolk um, with just the help of about 30 volunteers. So, yeah, incredibly effective way of doing it. And we know that we, we've got breeding populations on those sites as well. So it's been really positive. So, yeah, that was kind of our, one of our first projects. But uh, in 2019, we also launched a water well reintroduction project. Yeah. So this is our first kind of urban-based species reintroduction project um, that was, is focusing on a chalk stream called the Hogs Mill in southwest London, so in the borough of Kingston. Mm. And on the river, water voles had gone locally extinct in 2017 uh, as a result of well, wider issues that's seen across the, across the UK. So habitat degradation, but primarily um, the invasive predator American mink, which yeah, had completely wiped out the population. So in 2019, we actually we launched the project and we trained up 60 local people to go out and survey the entire 10 kilometer catchment, looking for viable habitat to release the water walls back onto. Yeah. Um, after the surveys, we identified that actually the well, not unsurprisingly, but the location where they were last seen, which is the Thames Water site. So sounds strange but it's behind the Thames water the sewage treatment works on the river down there it's the non-public access site um it's by far the best um, location for a water release yeah. so once we chose the site it was really about getting the project into place um and, and up and running and that was really about kind of embedding the local community in it so we, we created project teams whether that be a habitat restoration team we've got a, a river monitoring team so a team that is doing weekly surveys looking for signs of american mink We've also got a fundraising team, so a team that help us actually leverage funds to pay for the water bowls themselves and run restoration days and all the rest of it. And we also have a community engagement team as well. So these are people going out and helping us with local community events, helping to raise the profile of the project. And yeah, it's been an incredibly successful a way of actually getting local people involved. We've had over 350 people take part in the project. We've probably got a core group of around about 40 who are either doing weekly surveys or joining monthly calls to discuss project updates and, and, and the next steps. And, and yeah, uh, we're, uh, we're well, delighted to say that in August of 2022, we released 101 water wells back onto the river. Um, so, yeah, they're now back on the river and we've had our first feeding signs and um, footprints identified. So we know that they are they're surviving. They're still there. Um, they are still there, yeah. So hopefully, as long as a few make it through the winter, we should be seeing quite a lot of horse falls back on the, on the river in springtime, which is really exciting. But um, so yeah, so that kind of, in a nutshell, is what we try and do in terms of the community empowerment aspects. Um, but we are we're working on other projects as well. So we are running a beaver reintroduction project. So this kind of kick-started in 2021 with the launching of the London Beaver Working Group which we launched in collaboration with the Beaver Trust. Yeah. And this was really to identify two scenarios for beavers back in the urban landscape in London. The first being a natural recolonization event. So we know there's free living beavers as close as Kent and also in Oxfordshire. So it's not out of the realms of possibility that one will just turn up in London in the next kind of five to 10 years. And those are so from really other reintroductions, to... are they essentially? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, basically it's kind of escapees, uh, yeah, I imagine, basically into the into the wild. And um, so we know that they are they are wild living um, and we know that they can move quite long distances. So, well, they will essentially be in London before, you know, uh, pretty soon, I imagine. So yeah, we wanted to have some sort of joined up thinking across different governing bodies, across uh, different NGOs, people who are working on rivers throughout London about what do we do if that situation arises. Um, but then also as part of that, we wanted to be quite, quite pro proactive about reintroduction. So getting people used to living alongside beavers in a, uh, well, a penned population um, under natural England gu guidelines at the moment, um, and just showcasing what these animals can do in terms of blood prevention and filtering off pollutants, also creating amazing wetlands that can provide habitat for all sorts of different wildlife um, and also sequestering carbon as well. So yeah, we've been really pressing ahead with looking at viable sites across London. I think we've done nine different site visits um, to literally all four corners of London. Um, 
we actually did visit all four corners in one day on one site visit day, which is quite yeah, bit of a slog, but it was good fun. Um, but I've been since been working with Ealing Wildlife Group, um, Ealing Council, and the Friends of Horsenden Hill on a site called Paradise Fields in um, in Ealing, which is an absolutely incredible yeah habitat for beavers. Essentially, it's got um, it's got an incredible lagoon on there, which would be perfect for them got water coming in which it would do a great job in terms of yeah, holding up water for preventing flooding downstream in the greenford area yeah um so yeah that project we, we submitted a license to natural england and we're just waiting on the outcome of that and then hopefully we'll be able to, to kick that off this year yeah fingers crossed so exciting sort of going from the grasshoppers to the water voles to beavers and what i'm hearing is sort of several elements one is community involvement so important you're not just doing this on your own you're involving local people giving them roles to play get you know making them a, a significant part of the project and you know allowing you to do so much more as a result and choosing species carefully i guess you know sort of the charismatic flagship keystone however you define them but like one species which all the other species or many other people are going to benefit from you know if you get a a beaver of all in place it says you've got a healthy ecosystem and it will help to create more health within that ecosystem right yeah exactly that and even with the the large marsh grasshopper it it's uh it can act as a because we're working closely with organizations like natural england yep. um norfolk wildlife trust as well and we're working on their sites which have been restored for many a year um and are now kind of prime locations for reintroductions of species such as this so it really does kind of act as that. This is how we kind of, it's the, the last piece in the puzzle almost of a restoration project to show this is how we can actually bring back species once you do some, you know, incredible restoration work. So yeah, I think it all has to, has to align in that sense, but I think they can have that wider value, even a small species like that. Yeah. And uh, you're seeking funding right now for the eating beaver reintroductions. Like what What's... What's your funding goal, you know, and how can people get behind the support if they like the sound of it? Yeah, so in before Christmas, we launched our, our first ever winter appeal, yeah. uh, which is yeah raising funds for the Beaver Project, which is we've got a, 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 an aim to, to raise £50,000, which will essentially help us to spearhead the project. So not only deliver on the actual reintroduction itself, and paying for staff time, but also supporting with infrastructure costs, community engagement, getting local volunteers involved through in surveys or becoming our what we're calling our beaver believers, um, people nice. to actually go around the fence perimeter and checking every on a daily basis to see if everything's intact. So all of that sort of work, but also heading up the um, London Beaver Working Group so that we can keep the ball rolling with that, keep having those ongoing discussions around beavers more widely in the London landscape and then potentially even kind of ex extending that out to, to more urban areas and thinking about how we can apply what we've learned here to, to different urban, urban areas um, and thinking about other projects potentially in London as well. So, yeah, so that that appeal is currently live. Um, and as I said, yeah, we're, we're trying to fundraise for that at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. Sounds like an absolute bargain as well. And we're in January 23 right now. So if you're listening to this, you know, within the next few months, I guess, you know, and you're interested, please do support it. It sounds great. Um, looking forward, I mean, it does feel like rewilding has picked up real traction over recent years. There's more and more organizations working on it, more individuals training up to work in it too. And it's all great. Where do you see the future going? Like, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now, you know, what do you think, let's say the UK might look like from a rewilding perspective? That is a great question. I would personally, I would like to see more kind of widespread adoption on just larger areas of land. Mm -hmm. um, so I think NEP, Wild Ken Hill, um, Derek Gow's Coons Head, um, Rewilding, I think, especially in kind of, well, I'm talking for kind of southern Britain at the moment, anyway, mm -hmm. southern England. I think they're they've kind of laid down a marker in terms of what's possible on uh, maybe traditional farmland, and I think um, there is a really good case there for for more places to adopt it. I wouldn't necessarily. I don't. I'm not in the camp that we need to rewild absolutely anywhere and everywhere. 
some places are going to be more appropriate for continuing farming um and i'm yeah completely aware of that mm -hmm. but if there are areas of, of land that i think are suitable for it and landowners are up for it i would love to see more people adopting that because not only are there huge biodiversity uh, biodiversity benefits but there's also ecosystem services that can be regained from that um and i also think there's a it's a growing industry that I think for conservation to be sustainable and survive long term, I think is a, is a valuable thing. I think you, the UK could have potentially its own kind of booming ecotourism industry, um, whether that be kind of what, uh, you know, domestic tourism, people going to visit these incredible sites and enjoying what's on their doorstep more. I think that, that for me is a really promising thing. And I hope as well that it, even if it's not necessarily adopting what people might term as being kind of pure rewilding principles, I just really hope that even if we can keep this word and the phrase going in this kind of sphere, that it can keep people excited about nature conservation more broadly and the environment and protecting species, protecting habitats, um, and making behavioural changes as well that are going to have a, a better impact on the environment. That's my hope anyway. Yeah. Um, I think we've seen it in other realms of conservation, things like the slightly more kind of depressing notes, you know, like all the plastics and, and the kind of the wave that that had in terms of changing mindset. Yep. I'm hoping it will have a similar effect in terms of long-term behavioural changes and also policies as well going forward. Um, that, that's my hope for, yeah. for, for rewilding anyway. Yeah, and hope's such a key word there as well. And, I, and it's so important as a conservationist to be optimistic. You know, we're up against a, a real battle. We're losing quite a lot of battles. But, um, yeah, if we're not hopeful, if we don't have solutions like rewilding that can actually act fast, you know, at scale, then, um, yeah, there's no point in doing what we're doing, you know, and, and rewilding really is sort of providing a great example of that, you know, of hope. Yeah. You, you mentioned yeah, a word there a couple of times. I just want to make sure the audience understands what we mean when we talk about ecosystem services. You know, that's something you've mentioned a couple of times there. Um, I guess that often means things like clean water, flood prevention, things that nature provides to us, you know, for free, essentially. But could you paint a better picture than me for that, just so people understand what we mean by that? Yeah, so... Ecosystem, well, as I've said, yeah, ecosystem services in uh, simplest form are essentially the benefits that we gain from the natural world. Yep. Um, and I think thinking about that in terms of rewilding, I think the epitome of ecosystem services we can gain from a species reintroduction is has got to be the beaver. Um, if you think about mm. just their instinctual nature of damming up water creates wetlands those wetlands will then through the sedimentation will be storing carbon that will be taking carbon out of the atmosphere which is going to have a benefit for humans because that's going to help to mitigate climate change mm -hmm. that in turn those that beaver dams in turn are going to be holding up water so that's going to reduce flooding downstream again mm -hmm. just a benefit that humans can take from the natural world mm -hmm. And those dams themselves will also be filtering off pollutants. So we're going to have cleaner water, um, again, which is going to be a benefit for humans. So I think, in terms, without going into too much detail, because mm. I probably don't know all the details about ecosystem services, if I'm perfectly honest, but it, yeah, it, yeah. for me, it's very much I, thinking in simplistic terms about like what we can take from nature that also with, yeah, that is going to be beneficial for us. I also think it's very careful. I have mentioned that ecosystem services twice, but I also am a firm believer in the kind of intrinsic right of nature to exist um, and that we should just have some, we don't really need to justify it. And I think yeah. often, sadly, in, in this kind of industry, you do because funding is competitive and you have to justify the means for having these things and green spaces and all the rest of it. But um, coming into this industry, my, my firm belief is that, yeah, we, there's an intrinsic value of nature and um whilst we can put a label on it, it we don't necessarily need to um but yeah ecosystem services uh, yeah it's just basically all about yeah. what benefits can we garner from, from nature and what can they bring about for us 
Yeah, but nature for nature's sake, I'm all about that too. I'm sure lots of listeners are as well. Yeah, uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about you and your role, and if I can kind of change gears within the conversation. So, what what's your current role within Citizen Zoo? Like, what's your job title, and what what are your responsibilities? And paint a picture of a typical day, week, month, whatever. If someone wants to kind of understand what it is you're doing. Yeah, so I my job title is the is senior urban rewilding officer. Mm-hmm. And it spans quite a lot of different areas. We're, we're a small organization, so part and parcel of that is being fairly nimble, doing kind of yeah. anything and everything that's required. Um, the bulk of what I do is project delivery, though. So working on both our, well, all of our projects. So the grasshopper projects I mentioned, beaver projects, uh, water bowls. I didn't mention our wild tolls project, which is looking at adopting kind of rewilding grazing principles on a 42 hectare site in Kingston as well. Yeah. But my main chunk of work is really just making sure that we're delivering all of our project deliverables yep. um, on, a, on a month-to-month basis. So whether that be running habitat restoration sessions, um, running community event, community engagement events, yep. uh, chairing meetings for the water well projects, um, coordinating camera trap volunteers, coordinating rink raft checking volunteers. Um, yeah, so in terms of project stuff, that kind of, yeah, it revolves around that. Essentially, one of the big bits of work I'm doing at the moment on our Wild Tollworth project is writing a new management plan for the site. So um, I coordinated over the past year and quite a you a lot of ecological surveys so a lot of my work in the month of christmas and post has been looking at all of that data all of those reports and thinking about what that means for the site and what that means in terms of our proposed management for it and what benefits that management plan would bring out yeah so yeah i'm doing a lot of writing on that at the moment um i do quite a bit of fundraising as well Mm -hmm. so in the past that has been Anything from corporate fundraising, so working with um, local businesses in ways that they could potentially support us. So we worked with a local brewery who made a really cool bespoke beer um, for us, and a portion of that, uh, their profits uh, went to some zoo. Nice. We, um, yeah, we launched the appeal last year, so that I, I headed up kind of, yeah, delivering on that as well, and um, yeah, kicking that off, and also, in the last year, quite a lot of grant fundraising as well. So, writing different bids uh, for, to different funders and trying to source, yeah, funding for either project specific or just wider cause more generally. Um, and then everything right through to day to day admin as well. Um, <laughs> kind of Nitty gritty stuff. Um, so that's involved. Yeah, so it's pretty varied. Yeah, and even yeah, a bit of communications as well. So, do some social media and that sort of work as well. Yeah. What do you particularly enjoy about your role? What are the best bits that you, yeah, it kind of really lights a fire? And and the flip side, what do you want to share that frustrates or challenges that we do not enjoy? You know, we just want to be transparent about what it's like to work in the sector. So I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts and on that. I really, I do really enjoy. I love doing conservation delivery days. Yeah, because you meet some really interesting people. You get your kind of stalwarts will be there week in week out and then you also get the people who have traveled an hour and a half from Sussex or somewhere like that just for a day's conservation volunteering and yeah just getting to meet new people learning about like what they do why they're interested in it and uh, that is a really great part of the job all the while kind of being outside in nice nature reserves and doing some pretty fun tasks yeah so that's definitely one of the perks my I really like well my mind kind of works in the way of uh, spreadsheets and organization and stuff so mm-hmm. it might sound boring for some people but i like the project oversight side of things i like ticking stuff off my list especially mm-hmm. i find that incredibly satisfying so just the very bare basics of going through a project trackers and working out what's been done what's behind schedule and what needs a prompt and nudge and stuff i find that quite almost therapeutic so i like that part of the job as well in terms of, I do like um, grant fundraising, even though it can be frustrating at times. I do like kind of building that narrative. Um, I, my background before I worked in this role, I did, I did comms, so I do like writing as well. So I like 
having that story to tell and yeah. justify why you have a need for it and thinking about the criteria and how it matches your projects and all the rest of it. I thought I quite like having that kind of political um, yeah. task to do. Yeah, it's quite creative too, isn't it, actually, as well, yeah. Yeah, and thinking about, you know, what's going to fit and what's not. Um, and yeah, I, I do quite like that. That also brings with it elements of the job that I find frustrating. Obviously, conservation is a... It, in terms of funding, it's incredibly competitive. There's only limited funds out there. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the charity sector in, in general, actually, I guess that probably that's true for. Um, and it can be difficult because you think you've got a great project and you, you know it's worthy of funding and you, and you can come up short sometimes. But that can be difficult as well because sometimes it, you feel it could be more of a subjective thing and what you think is a great project, someone on the the board marking that um, against the price set of criteria might, might think otherwise, and it can come down to, to a subjective opinion at times. But mm. um, yeah, so it's difficult. That that can be difficult, but I, it was, does also make it that much sweeter when you manage to secure some funds in the in the long term. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably the the main things that I kind of struggle with as well. Um, but no, overall, it's a, it's a great job. Um, as I said, because we're small as well, we're, we're, we're ambitious and we're open to new ideas and trying new things as well. So I find that a nice kind of working environment as well where you can pitch something and kind of run with it. Yeah. And just trial it. And if it doesn't work, you learn from it and move on. If it does, it's, you know, it's great. So, yeah, it's been a really good part of the job to, to test new things. That must, must be a nice yeah, perk of being in a kind of fairly small charity startup, small team. You can be nimble, you can learn. I think as organisations grow, it, it you know it slows down a little bit the dynamism, dynamism sometimes. So, yeah, it sounds like how big is Citizen Sue? I thought like on the site it looked like you maybe a dozen staff, but maybe you're more or few. I don't know. Uh, so, in terms of full time staff, I'm currently working full time on it, and then we have lots of people who donate time as, as part time or volunteer, yeah, um, just their time, kind of in in addition to their day to day jobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, in terms of like full time equivalent, probably. Three, three to four currently working on, yeah. the, on the on the business now. Um, but then our project teams kind of are pretty wide. So, for example, the large marsh grasshopper reintroduction project. We've got a project team, I think, of about six people. Yeah. Um, who donate huge amounts of their time to that project, incredible mm. amounts of time, um, and are really incredibly committed um, to working on it. So, yeah, we've got people from all over just just helping in, chipping in. Um, but yeah, and the fingers crossed, we'll, we'll keep it. We'll continue growing and, and you know, kind of solidify those core teams as well and expand out. Yeah, fantastic. Um, sticking with you then briefly, like what um, what has been your career to date? Then, like you mentioned, you've worked in communications previously. Like when you look back, what have been like the key moments that have helped to progress you to where you are at the moment? Um, does this Include can I go back to education then? Absolutely, yeah. Right Absolutely, yeah. What what's been important, yeah. Uh so I originally studied uh for a degree in geography. Right. Uh, it was a it was a BSc, but I did up until my third year, I did all human modules just because I preferred all of the options that were human ones. <laughs> and then in my third year, I did something called the geography of life, which was basically looking at geological history, um, yeah, evolutionary history and all the rest of it, and then modern day conservation. And I realized that was something I was very interested in and kind of passionate about. It did feel quite late in the day in my third year to finally realize that, but that was kind of light bulb moment. Um, and then I ended up doing my dissertation that year on the conservation merits around SeaWorld and whether it was beneficial or whether it was purely for entertainment, which mm. sounds quite random, but ended up being quite a sociological study. But doing that, I realised actually, well, that combined with that module, I realised actually I would like to work in kind of conservation and actually try and do some good and do stuff that I'm fairly you know, passionate about. Yeah. So that was kind of, yeah led me down this whole path. So I worked for a year after I left university and saved for a master's um, and then did a, an MSc in conservation ecology at Oxford Brooks, yep. 
which was really great in terms of just opening doors for well everything because I've never really done anything like that before it was quite full on in terms of a change of pace and a change of direction um and it, and it didn't matter um, that you didn't have a ecology conservation biology background they were happy to accept someone from geography in yeah so we had we had people a lot of well it ended up being quite a small course i think because at the time the um i can't remember why actually but it was a small course and then the following year it doubled so we only had like six people on the course actually. right but of them i think four were changing completely direct, changing direction two yeah. had been on the kind of undergrad equivalent at Oxford Brooks that year um so it was a really good course and I, I got a lot out of it and in tandem with that I did a lot of volunteering and practical conservation stuff did hedgerow surveying mammal surveying and all the rest of it <laughs> and yeah and then since then I mean just kind of throwing myself into various different volunteering roles that I could I managed to, when I graduated, I managed to get a internship with Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, mm -hmm. um, which was basically, well, it was a, it was a lottery funded project that was working with 11 to 24 year olds um, to engage them in nature conservation in urban areas across the county. So whether that be Gloucester City or the t various towns across the county. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a brilliant project, just learning about well, young people in general and working with them um, and trying to get them interested in, in the wildlife there, also practical conservation skills. Um, and there's part of that, I did a lot of the comms for the project, mm. which then I think basically I moved to London and I had a, yeah, I loved, I loved this job. I worked for an organization called Galapagos Conservation Trust mm. as their, I was communications and membership officer. Um, so pretty varied, again, a fairly small charity that was, I think 10 of us in total when I left. Um, yeah. That was doing various roles, so fundraising, content creation, so whether it be website, pages, blogs, um, writing the impact report or annual review, uh, membership fundraising, appeals, events. Yeah, did all sorts. And yeah, met some great people, worked with some great people, and yeah, loved my time there. Um, so I did that, I was there for three years, and then I'd always wanted to, at some point to go into kind of practical conservation and had, I'd kind of struggled just because I'd never really had that long-term, well, I see, I'd never really had that long-term employment in a practical conservation role aside from working for Gloucester Wildlife Trust, but that was only a six-month internship. So I kind of always struggled to get my foot in the door um, of kind of going to a practical role. Um, but then this job with Citizen Zoo came up and it was kind of, perfect for me because it was a bit of a split between fundraising type work some business development um as well as the kind of on the ground delivery of stuff so a bit of content yeah, a bit of community up, and yeah yeah it ended up being kind of a a, a, a mix of everything i've done in the past so yeah it was kind of perfect um and then yeah i'm, I'm three well two two years and a month on and i'm, I'm still here I'm still loving it so, yeah it's been great <laughs> fantastic yeah what advice would you give someone who's listening that uh, would maybe like to follow a similar path or would just like to work in conservation um, uh, and want to know some of the key things that should sort of bear in mind, you know? Um, I would definitely say persevere. That's something that I definitely found key just because it is, sadly, it is a competitive industry. I think because it is in my view, fairly underfunded. Mm. So there's limited spaces for roles and roles coming up. I think that is changing, which I think is good. And I think you can see that by the number of different jobs that are coming out, even like post the pandemic, we're seeing more and more jobs coming available, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I think it is key to persevere because you may, may not get that one role that comes up, but I think another one will come up down the line. Yeah. And it's always worth, um, you know, just, just, persevering with it and it, i mean it's this must be the age-old bit of advice but just volunteering as much as possible or going to any events that you think are relevant where you might be able to network with people because yeah you will just learn the odd skill that might be useful further down the line um that 
you know you can put on the CV that makes you stand out and makes you of interest to, to that um, to that organization or even meeting someone or so your name's kind of fresh in their memory um, and you learn from people as well I think mm -hmm. that's really key and also you just yeah there's, there's lots of opportunities out there for stuff like it, like these days which is great um, and I think you can take key learnings from from it so yeah that would be my main things um, yeah and also actually in hindsight, I loved my master's and I learned a lot from it. And I think because I was coming from a slightly different background, it was a good intro for me. But in, I don't know if it was absolutely necessary in terms of hmm. getting into conservation because there's there are opportunities for internships and things out there now, which maybe there weren't. Or if they were... I didn't know about them at the time, but that's probably because I just hadn't been like immersed myself in this this kind of sector. Yeah, but I think you can learn just as much on the job or volunteering as you can actually, um, kind of from a master's in many a way, in many ways. Um, yeah, I think especially if you're working kind of urban conservation, where it's a lot about community engagement and working alongside different people and, and the, yeah, and the yeah, what that entails. I think volunteering and and um, yeah, that sort of, of work is going to be just as valuable in many ways. So I don't think it's absolutely vital to, to go down that route at all. Yeah, experience can beat education often, right? Yeah, to be able to prove you can do something um, rather than say, I've learned about it. Yeah, one, one built on the other, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just as kind of like a, 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 I guess a closing question. I'm conscious of time. I'm aware you're going to get a car delivered as well in about an hour or so's time. So <laughs> we're going to wrap things up. Yeah. Um, when when you think about conservation and when we think about biodiversity change over time or wildlife declines, let's put it in sort of you know simpler terms. As a global movement, you know, reports are often saying that things are getting worse. You know, and, it, and we're sort of fighting a you know an uphill battle. What do you think conservationists need to do better or more of or change? What are we doing wrong? That is a, is that more in terms of the way that we communicate it or the way that we're actually doing things on the ground? Honestly, you can interpret the question as you wish. Yeah. What do we need to change? Would you think as a, as a, you know, to have more impact as a, as a movement of conservationists, we're all absolutely doing our best. Uh, but are there things we need to do more of or, 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 or improve us, you know, interpret as you wish. I actually don't think, I, I think the evidence is there that conservation has been working extremely hard. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of above and beyond for the past, well, since conservation has really been starting doing conservation work. And I think, sadly, it often it's not so much around what conservationists are doing right or wrong, but I think there's policies in place that are above what we can do on the ground that mean that, sadly, it's not having a, a much of an, it's, it's an uphill struggle, essentially. Yeah. essentially. And I think that's part of the wider issue of public um, opinions and maybe a lack of appreciation around the natural world and what it does for us and that appreciation lack of appreciation often comes around because people haven't experienced wildlife and they haven't experienced nature reserves whether that be because you're living in an inner city area where you don't have them hmm. you can't get that access or whether it's just not publicized to people or they don't have the accessibility of getting out there in a car um, I think there's a lot more societal issues out there that are causing problems that underlying that is kind of behavioral issues um which are instilled because of um problems for people actually being able to experience wildlife if you can't experience the wildlife in, in, in nature you're not going to want to protect it so i think that's really where we're at and i think that's the the, the underlying theme of why we're in kind of the mess that we're in and I think it's going to take both bottom up and top down changes to make any long term impact that's going to be beneficial. And I'm hoping things are starting to change. I think the pandemic has shown that people want to have more green space. They want to get outside more and they want to experience 
the natural world and we know that it's good for people's mental health and well-being so hopefully that kind of desire to do that i think we're starting to see that in terms of funding opportunities that are coming out from governing bodies for environmental projects and hopefully that kind of bottom-up top-down approach we'll meet somewhere in the middle and we'll start to see some really positive changes i think that for me is key is is having that kind of joined up thinking from both ends and hopefully yeah instill some behavioral changes to 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 the wider public and, and make people appreciate what what's what's around them and kind of what's at stake as well um yeah yeah Sorry, probably a bit of a tangent to the no, like tangent it. answer, but yeah, no, I like it. And what I heard is, is we need more connection to wildlife, you know, as individuals, and that would trigger people, perhaps caring more, more action, more funding, all that sort of stuff. And a lot of it comes down to how we create those connections and motivate. Yeah, yeah, I totally, I, I'm totally with you. Yeah, Ben, it's been so nice talking to you. Thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts um yeah if people want to find out a bit more about you or citizen zoo or, or to get involved or to support your london beaver fundraiser um where should we send them uh yeah so if you just head over to our website you can just search for citizen zoo um if you also if you just search rewild our future you should come up on any search engine we should be hopefully with the top link on there um and yeah on the home page you guys find all the links to our appeal page uh, if you'd like to become a member as well, we've got membership packages which people can subscribe to. Yep. And if you'd just like to sign up to our newsletter, we run a rewilding newsletter. So we round up everything rewilding related from the from the months just gone by and condense it into one kind of short newsletter for you. It's a really nice way of getting all that information. So you can sign up to that. And then we also have a volunteer newsletter for anyone who's interested in getting involved in any of our projects where you can yeah hear about any upcoming opportunities that we've got. Yeah, that's great. And I get your newsletters and they are great. So I definitely encourage people to kind of find what's going on. It's just a nice digest, really, of rewilding yeah, news. So that's great. Ben, wonderful Thank chatting. Thanks so much for your time. No problem at all. Thanks so much for having me on. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.